All right, guys, welcome back to the Free Life Agents podcast. And today we have a guest um, with a very big resume, and um, as you guys might have known, but um, we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, real estate video marketing. Um, I, this is definitely today's guest uh, expertise. So just to kind of list off a little bit about you know who I'm bringing on uh, today as a guest, um, he has built one of the biggest YouTube channels for real estate, uh, in my opinion, in the world with close to 60,000 subscribers on YouTube uh, on the Property Limb Brothers channel. And he is definitely one of the leading innovative uh, market leaders uh, when it comes to real estate in Singapore uh, as well. But without further ado, I want to bring uh, onto my show uh, my guest for today, Melvin Lim. Melvin, uh, welcome to the Hi, show. Kobe. Hi, good yeah. to be here. Thanks thanks for inviting. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say in the world, I would say that maybe in Singapore, <laughs> yeah, we are we're one of the most uh, active uh, content creators in real estate uh, videos. But um, yeah, happy to be here. Happy, happy to, to um, yeah, chat uh, over your channel. Thanks for, you. Thanks for the, the invitation. Yeah, no problem, man. Um, I think, uh, so for, for the listeners who are listening to this uh, right now who might not be familiar with Melvin, um, he's super humble. Um, I've only spoken to him a couple of times and I can already tell. So um, you're going to get a lot of that today. But just so you know, you guys are speaking to somebody who's, um, uh, if you guys see his channel, the, the videos are absolutely um, you know, professional grade. And that's what we're going to be talking a little bit about today is how to build a YouTube channel for real estate. But Melvin, when we get started here, um, you know, we're just going to have a chat and you're just going to share a little bit about, you know, what you guys are doing and some of your experience as well. So, I mean, if you don't mind, just kind of sharing how you kind of got started in real estate business and a little bit on, on your background. Sure. Yeah. So um, my my first uh, real job, uh, real career was actually a, um, um, as a prison officer in, um, in my early days, um, the moment that uh, I was almost completing my university. So, so um, I was serving the Singapore Prison Service as a prison officer for about three years. And then towards the last year, uh, as I was about to complete my bond, I actually wanted to go into the financial industry as a, as a banker, right? So because I studied banking and finance and um, just so happens that I chanced upon a friend who was starting out in the real estate industry and that just got me so interested. And thus, um, I followed that path, um, did real estate, uh, what intrigued me um, as a very young person back then in my mid-20s was that this is like one of uh, the only chance that uh, we can step into the product to try and sell the product to somebody else. And, and it's like you are, you're always inside a product talking to the buyer that is in the product as well and you're selling that entire product to the, to the, the person. So it's like, it's so intriguing. Uh, it's also like one of the largest asset a person will ever own. So that got me really excited. And um, I've been doing real estate for the past 15, 16 years since um, the 20, late 2006 period. And um, for the past 15, 16 years, uh, basically there was quite a fair bit of journey because when we first started, we were in like the very early days that all the realtors are using Nokia phones and Blackberries, and you know, um, there was no, there was no like portals, there was no, no usage of websites and things like that. So we see the entire transformation from very traditional marketing um, towards uh, today's context. Yeah. So I still remember that in the early days, my very first book was these two books, and uh, the first book that I picked up was um, the Art of Selling Real Estate by Tom Hopkins, and then. The second book that I picked up was uh, The Millionaire Real Estate Agent by uh, Kelly Williams. So this was my like two bread and butter 15 years ago. Yeah. And uh, about five years ago, um, in 2006 December, uh, we uh, try our stint at the very first um, video home tour in Singapore with a presenter uh, format kind of uh, walkthrough. And um, that got us uh, started in this entire journey of video creation, content creation. Um, and we call it our signature home tours. And of course, a lot of the inspiration came from uh, the United States and um, a lot of different realtors from the world. And back then, uh, because, because Singapore is a very small but competitive market, right? So Singapore, from one end to the other, you can actually drive and travel uh, in less than an hour and wow in, in terms of size we are only zero well we're almost like 0 0.6 percent of new york that's all in terms of our size <laughs> but uh, we have about six million people here and thus uh, is it is competitive here 
uh, but at the same time, it's also very exciting. So um, back then, uh, in 2006, December, when we started the first video, uh, we started to see a lot of positive uh, kind of spin-offs from there. And thus, that got us towards a whole journey of creating a brand, um, creating a USP and core focus on using video to, to represent homes. Yeah, And uh, till date, we have created close to uh, about 1,300 videos uh, thus far in the past five years. And uh, through the past five years, we also started different things within the, the real estate business. For example, the commencement of an inside sales team, um, pivoting as a brand, um, not so much like um, a franchise kind of business. And um, I think that the involvement over the past 15 years has has been pretty interesting yeah, for us. So, so our, our brand is called Proptilin Brothers. In short, it's called PLB. Yeah, and uh, uh, I'm the co-founder together with my partner. Uh, my partner has been, been um, partnering with me for the past 15 years. So I also hold uh, the role as the CEO now. And uh, right now in Proptilin Brothers, we have about 103 teammates. Uh, out of the 103 um, uh, teammates that we have, half of them are... Uh, functioning and serving in the back-end team. And then the other 50% of them, they are in the inside sales team. And uh, that's how we function over here in, in Proctor Limbras. Yeah. 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 Thanks for sharing, <laughs> Melvin. I mean, that's quite a journey you've been uh, you've been on, you know, all the way from being a prison officer to being, yeah. you know, leading, uh, so, you know, real estate celebrity almost, the, the Ryan Serhan of of real estate in Singapore. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't right. compare them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Ryan's right. is way bigger. I mean, he's, 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 he's all about inspiration as well. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that's interesting you brought that up because that's kind of what I wanted to ask is, you know, you've been on kind of this, this wonderful journey of, you know, I see, you know, of imagination and creativity when it comes to real estate and how you guys present the homes that you guys are selling, you know, really beautiful videos online. And, you know, you said when you first start, first got started in real estate, you picked up two books, right? The Gary Keller's Millionaire Real Estate Agent. You know, everybody in the States have, you know, if they're a real estate agent, that's the first book they get recommended. Um, and, and Tom Hopkins, who's a legend in the industry, as, as many people know. So, you know, did you, is that something customary, um, kind of like in your market to uh, pick up, you know, kind of lessons that you're learning from overseas? Or is that something that you chose to do on your, on your own uh, when you first started, got, uh, you know, got started in the industry? Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting question, Kobe. So, so when I got started, I realized that um, the industry back then, 10 over years ago, very few realtors read books, actually. So, so um, the, um, because there was not much regulation, not much education in the industry, a lot of uh, the main culture is that a lot of realtors, they don't like to share knowledge and information. So um, the information sharing stage only evolved I think close to about 10 years ago. So, um, but even till today, I realized that a lot of realtors in Singapore don't really read a lot of uh, books. So we, we want to uh, try to spread the, the kind of um, best practices here as well uh, with our realtors, uh, as well as our, our co-working friends and things like that. But um, back then, basically, uh, why I, I chanced upon these two books is because I wanted to make sure that when uh, I kickstart the industry, I want to quickly model after the best practices and model after the key skills that is needed in a successful realtor. So anything that I can find uh, in the library, online and, and stuff like that, this, this seems to be the two really solid guidebook with a lot of systems, a lot of scripts and uh, a lot of mindset uh, perspectives. So um, yeah, those two back then were really uh, solid books that kickstarted. And um, um, I think one of your questions is relating to um, the learning journey, right? Who do we model after? So uh, because it's in Singapore, I think that uh, Singapore is, st is still quite a young country. We are only like 50 over years old since independence. So uh, I think a lot of the influence will come from the West, uh, will come from the bigger boys in Asia as well. So definitely, I think a lot of materials are available overseas. And, and of course, now online, we can learn so much uh, from one another. So yeah, so so over the years, I, I think it has still largely been been books from, from America that, that we, we chance upon. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's something that you guys picked up on, right? Is the, the mindset yeah. aspect of it. And that's, that's very, that's very interesting. I mean, is that 
something that you guys are seeing a lot of in the in the industry in, in Singapore? Or is that something that you guys are very unique when when it comes to, you know, using certain mindsets when it comes to selling real estate? Because I see you guys are, are doing a lot. I think you guys are, you know, putting a lot of content out there that are, you know, very focused on, you know, mindset and how, you know, one should behave and perform and act as an agent <laughs> versus, you know, versus somebody else who might be, you know, doing something doing something you know a little bit different more more just real estate focused so is that is that something that's very mm. unique to you guys is picking up on the on the right mindset yes um because over the years what um i realized is that um real, becoming a realtor has some um, a lot of different kinds of uh challenges and um the the mindset part is is an extremely important aspect because the moment somebody comes to the industry with a wrong perspective and expectation, um, it drastically affects their performance very quickly within the first year. So, um, I think uh, being a realtor is an extremely uh, anxious business. Yeah, and uh, a lot of people step in, not knowing that they are actually um, becoming an entrepreneur or a solopreneur. So they they come in with a mindset that you know they are still thinking that hey, hey you know I'm like an employee kind of mindset and. Uh, I'm supposed to have like, you know, a very regular income and, uh, you know, um, I might be able to have a bit more flexibility, but actually, if you are talking about a real solid realtor business, um, in fact, the amount of work that you have to put in is, is a lot more times if um, you are, you're doing like a, a fixed remuneration arrangement in the past. So I think the mindset of... Um, Becoming a very good solopreneur and entrepreneur at the start is extremely important so that the, the realtor don't self-sabotage themselves. And what do I mean by self-sabotage is that um, based on our observations for so many years, a lot of people, they drop out within the first year because um, they keep looking back and they keep thinking about alternatives and, and they keep telling themselves that, hey, you know, if I cannot close the deal in six months, I cannot close the deal in 12 months. I'll go back to my fixed salary job. Um, I'll do something else, or I'll just, just keep, you know, thinking that I have a backup plan, which is nothing wrong. But I think that uh, the concept of not burning your bridge, technically, also can self sabotage a, a person's success. So uh, I think that in terms of behavior, performance behavior, uh, there's a lot to it in in how a realtor thinks, and. Um, there's also a lot of like small little concepts, like a lot of realtor um, in, in Singapore, they have this concept that they try to uh, spend as little as possible. That means they, they don't want to reinvest into the business. And a lot of times the moment when they close a deal, or close a couple of, of big deals, they want to quickly take the money out of the business. And uh, thus, we always see a lot of uh, realtors not, not lasting in the industry because they might have one to two good years, but after the third year, suddenly you see that they disappear from the industry. And uh, all these things over the years uh, allow us to think on a deeper level on why are all these things happening? And is it because the person is not interested in the industry anymore? Or is it because that they still want to do well, but certain behaviors in the past or mindset has technically self sabotaged their, their, their success and performance? Yeah, that's really interesting that you mentioned that because I thought, you know, the the statistic that most of the real estate agents who drop out within their first year is just exclusive to the United States. But oh. uh, that's, yeah, because that's, I mean, that's that's like a, a running joke for, for us here in the States is that, you know, if you get your real estate license, there's about a 97% chance you're not going to make it past the first six months. So wow. it seems like that's, that's the way that, um, you know, how, how you guys are, are seeing things uh, in Singapore as well, which is it's super interesting. So I yeah. guess my next question is just, you know, how do you think that a newer agent, because I'm, I'm sure a lot of people listening to this podcast are maybe newer and starting an industry, but like, how do you think they should um, divide up the uh, the commission income that they're getting, um, you know, especially in the first couple of years where, you know, they might not be doing so well, might be kind of a struggle juggling two jobs, uh, you know, trying to get started in industry, but how do you think they should kind of divide that up where, you know, they should invest, uh, you know, maybe like 20%, 50% of their money back into the business. And then some of the other ones uh, they should keep, or maybe if they have, you know, two, two jobs, you know, invest a hundred percent of it into the business. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's an interesting question. So I think the, um, 
the hardest part is always the first one to two years and uh, during the transition is, is definitely the hardest part because you have to you not only have to make sure that you can survive and, and the key for the first year is survival um, and survival will mean that uh, it's important to plan in advance um, in, in my opinion is that the, the best way to survive is to make sure that for the first 12 months um, your personal expenses are taken care of but of course you have to first identify are uh, your personal expenses extremely high and which life stage are you in i mean do you already have a family do you have kids and uh what is your current lifestyle so i would think that it's important to take that into consideration set aside 12 months of personal expenses to make sure that your family expenses does not affect how you think in the business because once that is settled then whatever balance that you have, you can reinvest back into the business. But of course, um, survival will also mean that if you're coming from a fixed salary rearrangement or you still need to dabble a little bit of a part-time work for maybe six to, to eight months first while you try out real estate, I think that's totally fine. Um, because the because you, you need to make sure that you know you have a little bit of side income coming in and then make sure that while you're learning and growing, you can survive. Um, but first thing is, we always advise our guys that if you're doing that transition, you must set a time frame that maybe after eight months, you need to exit that part-time arrangement because having, having that dual kind of thing, uh, it affects you as well. Uh, it affects your time management. Um, it affects, of course, your ability to learn and, and grow quickly in the, in the new business, which is real estate. So having a timeline to exit is extremely important. Secondly, I think is that um, once your personal expenses are taken care of, um, what we did during the first year is that we reinvested everything back into the business. And we just want to make sure that um, we can... Sorry, okay, right. So um, we just want to make sure that um, the first year, whatever balance profits or balance revenue that comes in from the commission is flo floats back to the business because if we don't do that then technically we cannot invest in marketing we cannot invest in, in systems we, we cannot we cannot invest in campaigns and it will hurt what we are going to achieve in the second year so uh, we are a little bit more aggressive but but i think there are a lot of metrics on how a person want to manage uh in in, in this in this sense maybe just to give an example um we have um two realtors that uh, when they first started, what they, what they did was that um, because of the fact that they wanted to make sure that they can survive in the first 12 months, um, during the very early uh, wee hours in the morning, they will uh, drive, um, they, they, will do, they will do the job as a, as a grab driver for about five hours in the morning. And, and then, uh, so they wake up at 5 a.m., um, did grab driving up to about uh, 10 to 11 earn that income, at the same time having the income to sustain their daily expenses, yet that income can also pay for the rental of that car as well. And then they use the car for the rest of the day for real estate. So, so that's how they function for the first six months in order to, to dabble in the survival mode. Yeah, that's actually really creative. Um, I don't think a lot of, a lot of agents in the, in the States can uh, to do that. So maybe that's something that people can actually learn from. So that's, that's actually a really creative way to kind of get started in the, in the business. But yeah. I mean, just, just from, from you've, what you've seen, why do you think that, you know, a lot of people might not commit to, you know, being full-time in real estate early? Do you think it's just the lack of self-confidence or uh, fears or what do you think that is from what you've seen so far? Um, because of the fact that, um, the model here in Singapore is, is largely 90-10 model. So um, taking 90% um, as a solopreneur uh, will mean that in terms of what uh, agencies will provide, um, they can only do a certain limited kind of range of support. Um, of course, a lot of agencies in Singapore, they're, they're doing very well. They're, there's tech support, there's uh, support in terms of uh, the CRM, there's a lot of training available that agencies are giving, but um, knowing that you're taking 90% will mean that you have to do lead gen all the way towards closing. Yeah, and I think one of the biggest anxious part of the business is that a lot of agents come into the business not knowing how to lead gen. And when they don't know how to lead gen, even though they attend so many trainings about 
how to do a seller presentation, how to do a buyer consult presentation, how to how to um, pitch a deal, how to market a property, how to present a home, how to negotiate, how to do a paperwork, how do you do financial calculation or portfolio planning and, and learning about all the real estate investing stuff. But they can learn everything about this, but if they don't learn the business side of things on how to lead gen, how to prospect, how to do solid marketing, how to do brand positioning, then they find that um, after about a 12 months period, uh, they are just unable to, to perform any kind of activities because there's no, there's no target audience to, to talk to. So um, the, key, the key anxious part about this business is, is that a lot of people thought that it's just about the method. They thought that it's about the skills and techniques uh, and the, the knowledge, but they didn't know that you're coming in to run this whole business yourself. And thus that creates a lot of anxiety. And when that reality comes into a reality check after a few months, they'll realize that the in order to do well is really about lead generation, right? And if you don't get that right, no matter what kind of CRM you subscribe to, you, you're, you're doing a lot of research every day, but you have no customers to serve, um, that, is, that will be the key problem. So yeah, Melvin, um, that's really interesting what you said about, um, you know, real estate agents needing to, you know, run it like a business and then coming mm -hmm. in and focusing on lead generation. So yeah. this is actually really good that you started talking a little bit about lead generation and why it's so important, because that's what I wanted to ask you a little bit more about and uh, pick your brain on was, you know, how did you guys get started uh, with video marketing? Was that a way for you guys to generate more leads in the beginning? Or is that just something that you saw as a, as a way to market. And then now it's become obviously your main, your main source of, of lead generation. Right? Yeah. So, so when we first um, started the, the first video in 2006, December, our key mindset was that um, we're just observing what's happening in the real estate space in Singapore. And we realized that when it comes to selling a property, the, it seems like the only way that um, everybody is using to help their home sellers is through taking photographs and then listing it um passively on portals yeah so um because of the fact that the singapore market is small there are only two to three dominant portals in singapore so when it comes to real estate portals is like uh an automated mode you when somebody asks you to list their property you just go up go up take photographs and then when you come back just list it online and then you wait for your phone to ring and um we just realized that it is like is really passive. It is really a very passive approach because it is so susceptible to market conditions. It's, it is so limited in terms of what you can do in terms of storytelling and marketing. And because of the fact that everything is in the portal space, it also creates a new kind of competition. That means if I want to help this owner to position their property differently, firstly, I cannot storytell. I cannot solve the obstacle that this property have just by showcasing photographs and typing in description in, in the box itself. Um, I cannot um, target consumers or I cannot target the right kind of buyers that might be interested in this type of property because maybe if I'm selling something in the town area, but there are investors in the outskirts area, they want to buy a second property for investment, but I cannot do that. And I cannot control where... Uh, uh, my ads are going to be shown so it remains like a very passive space it's like everybody just sharing the same same portal and, and they're just hoping that their phone will ring and um, the fourth level of competition is that if I'm selling a, a unit in this particular condominium and there's like a thousand units right here maybe at the point of listing the property there's maybe about 100 listings that is there that that probably there's a one, two, three, four bedrooms, uh, 100 listings are, are listed for sale. How am I going to differentiate myself with just one listing, right? So um, that then gave rise to, to us thinking a little bit deeper about how can we then help our owners to differentiate their properties. And then when we started video marketing, we realized that by doing um, a compelling video home tour, you are technically differentiating yourself out of the, the crowd. And... Um, if you can master digital marketing, if you can master how you utilize um, sponsored ads as well as uh, making a video more and more compelling through time, then basically we can control who and where we want to show the ads. So um, by doing video home tour, it has then allowed us to make 
the home more virtual and more mobile. And um, it has then created um, the mobility of us um, showcasing the, the video home tour in this particular location, or maybe we want to target buyers overseas. It allows us to do that as well. And um, the second tier is that we can then solve obstacles within the home tour. Yeah, we don't have to wait for physical viewing to happen. And then we explain um, 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 solutions to solve objections for the home. We can do that within the home tour itself. So I think it creates a new realm of, of, of uh, experience for the sellers as well as the buyers. Yeah, and I think it really does. And that's a really good point that you brought up is that you guys are able to target people uh, based on, you know, how you want to target them versus being passive, right? And that's, that yeah. in my opinion is, is very, uh, you know, very important because now you have control of the business versus on the other way around where they're controlling you. So, I mean, have you guys seen that, you know, with the shift video marketing, have you guys seen a lot of, you know, you guys are now back in control of the business versus in the past, maybe you guys are being controlled by the customers, you know, who might be reaching out to you and their timing and whatever. Yeah. So some of the, some of the, some of the things that we've been tracking for the past five years is that um, as we, um, so, so now when we list a property, um, um, I would say 98% of our listings will have a video home tour. Uh, some of the properties we are unable to film because maybe it might be tenanted uh, um, or maybe because of other uh, more sensitive information, we cannot showcase the house and things like that. Um, but uh, through the tracking over the past years, what we have noticed is that whenever buyers come physically, um, most of the feedback that we receive is that they have already seen the home tour about two to three times and thus they have decided to make time to come physically to view the place. And um, seven out of 10 buyers that uh, responded comes from social media. And uh, three out of 10 still come from portals, which is why we still use portals as well. So, um, but we have seen like the rise in, in having that the video as a key component when it comes to marketing. And uh, the net effect that we see is that uh, buyers are more genuine because um, instantaneously when we launch a home tour, like within the next one week, uh, thousands of people, maybe 10 or thousands of people will view the video. That is the first layer of viewing because uh, compared to in the past, you had to conduct so many physical viewings, but instantaneously within a week, let's say 10,000 video, 10,000 people watches the video. It could also mean that out of these 10,000, there are some people that just watch for fun, but there might be at least 50% that, is considering to buy a home, they watch it and then they decide whether should they come for the real physical viewing. So in our context now, we think that the first viewing actually takes place on the phone and the, the, the physical viewing technically is the second viewing. And this increases the amount of uh, genuine viewership. It helps the sellers to save time. Uh, it helps the buyers to save time because in the past before video marketing, a lot of buyers will come physically and then they say that, hey, I didn't know that this has only three bedrooms. Uh, I'm lo actually looking for a four bedder. Yeah, so, so it, it, it technically wastes everybody's time. Yeah, but based on feedback from both ends of the consumer spectrum, buyer says that home tours really help them to save a lot of time. Uh, it helps them to appreciate homes better. Seller says that home tours really increase the, the level of genuine uh, buyers that comes for viewing. So, so both ends um, benefit as well. Yeah. Wow. So I didn't ever even realize that, that you brought up a really good point is that it's a time saver now, right? Yeah. You know, doing, doing video home tours is a, it is a time saver for the agent, for the buyers and for the sellers, right? Cause when you're doing a video home tour, you might schedule it out for, you know, one day or two days for, you know, for reshoots or whatever. And then that's considered one showing. Uh, for the seller, but because you're uploading it online where everybody can see it, that's multiple showings, right? So yeah. you're saving time, you're condensing and then stretching time. It's essentially what you're yeah. doing. So that's, that's really yeah. interesting that you guys are, are doing yeah. that. And, and um, that kind of leads me to, you know, my, my question for you is I, you know, I've seen these beautiful home tours that you guys do on your channel and they really are very professionally made. And I really want to know if you could kind of, you know, dig a little bit more into the video creation process. I don't want to 
you know, have you spill all your secrets, but, you know, whatever you can share with us today, you know, what does your video creation process uh, actually look like, right? So what are you guys doing behind the scenes? Yeah, so um, because the, the Singapore real estate lands landscape is a bit different, so compared to uh, what you guys have in the States and uh, looking at the types of properties that we have here, uh, why is our landscape different is because we are a country that is only 50 over years old and um, the types of properties here that we have um, are not as uh, varying in terms of architecture and things like that. Yeah, so uh, out of the entire island, uh, in terms of real estate stock, we have about 1.1 million um, properties belonging to uh, what we call public housing. Yeah, so, uh, but our public housing, we call them the HDB apartments. They are really beautiful because the government spent a lot of effort in, in creating a high level of home ownership in Singapore. So uh, a lot of people will be surprised to know that in Singapore, 90% of all Singaporeans own their own homes. So uh, we are a nation of very high home ownership percentage and 1.1 uh, million um, real estate stock belongs to, real, to to HDB apartments. And then we have, in terms of condominiums, about 340,000. And then landed properties, we only have 73,000 landed properties. So uh, in terms of the varying types of real estate, it is vastly different from what we can see in overseas. Yeah, so uh, we need to get really creative when we do things here because uh, land is scarce. A lot of our apartments look really small. And um, when it comes to the video creation process, the home plays a huge part in, in ownership, in terms of viewership, because uh, based on tracking, larger homes attract more viewership, smaller homes, uh, lesser viewership, lesser attention. So we need to be creative um, and not just depend on what kind of homes are we filming. So uh, even when we get homes that are not so beautiful, maybe there's no renovation done inside, then we need to get really creative um, in terms of the way that we film, um, how we speak, what kind of angles do we weave in. Um, if it's not so much about the interior, how do we think about the investment angle? Um, and thus, coming back to the, the video creation process, I would say that the first step that we always do is um, looking at the product and then we do a lot of deep research. So we spend a lot of time uh, crafting out the USP of the property first. And how we craft it is that we try to visualize if I'm the buyer, I'm looking at this property, what will be my key objections that I have about this property? So we, we settle the objections. And then secondly, we look at what are the advantages of owning this property? So we try to find a USP. And then uh, the third thing is that using the objections and the USP, we try to figure out who is the key target audience and what kind of buyers will buy this home and where will they come from and um, will they be, be uh, single professionals or families that want to buy a second or third property for investment or will they be an overseas buyer? So we try to figure out who is the target audience and then we craft um, basically the key points that we want to mention in the home tour. Uh, and um, basically right now, we don't allow our, our uh, realtors to use a script so we want the articulation to be very smooth. We, um, we want the ideation to be in a mind map format. So usually our home tours are crafted in a mind map format so that it's easy to remember. Um, why we don't allow them to use a script is because it will seem very monotonous. And we want to basically have that home tour to be really like a real viewing. That means uh, it's as if like I'm presenting to a buyer that is walking through the home with us. So we want it to be as natural as possible. Yeah, so that's the, the scripting process. And then when it comes to production and post-production, uh, our in-house team has been with us for four to five years. So basically we have sort of like created um, uh, a very smooth way of production process in terms of ideation plus uh, the types of music to use. Um, what kind of music for what homes, what should be the, the, the way that we should edit, how should be the intro light, what is the outro, um, color correction, what kind of LUTs do we use, and um, how do we do pattern interruption. So a lot of all these things were developed over the years. Um, and uh, I think the, the most important thing is that 
the retention of attention is always a challenge. Uh. So we, we, uh, we are always trying ways and means on how do we increase the retention rate so that people will want to watch till the end. Yeah, so, so basically that's, that's just a rough process of how we do it. Yeah, and that's, that's interesting. You, you mentioned the uh, retention of attention because that's yeah. kind of what I want to ask is, is um, you know, how, because you, you guys have, you know, about 17 to, to 20 minute videos for, for home tours. Am I correct on that? Yeah. 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 So, I just, <clears throat> yeah, so when it comes to retaining their, their, you know, somebody's attention for 20 minutes, um, how do you guys usually go about that in the beginning? Are you guys setting up certain things in the story, like the story or the video later on where you're keeping their attention long enough so they see through it all? Yeah, so um, uh, when we started off our initial home tours for the first two years, they were they were pretty short home tours. They were usually about two to five minutes. And then um, over the years, based on feedback and tracking, we realized that um, consumers, um, when it comes to buying a, a product like real estate, because of the fact that it is a, a huge investment, the eventual real buyers that actually buy it, um, based on our tracking and survey, is that they find that the longer home tours helps them to make a more decisive decision. So, of course, there's always a struggle. Hey, should we create short, impactful uh, tours for higher viewership, higher retention? Or uh, what, are, what are the things that are actually working on the ground? And, and who are the people that are real buyers? Yeah, so, so we want to keep thinking about the real buyers, what do they want rather than as a general public, what do people want, right? So uh, when we balance that out, we find that um, the length that um, we're trying to create, uh, it should mimic as much as possible uh, on the amount of time that a real buyer spends in the physical viewing. So if I'm coming to a one beta to view a property, usually maybe the one beta viewing plus my interaction with the realtor probably will take about 10 minutes about there. Um, so we try to recreate the experience of a 10 minute home tour for maybe a one beta. If it's a landed property, usually a full viewing will take at least 20 minutes. So we try to recreate that 20 minutes in, in the home tour video as well. So, so that's basically our, our ideation. And um, we also realized that the higher the quantum price of the, the, the asset, um, the more people want to know and the more people want to see. And um, for example, if I'm selling like a $20 million uh, bungalow and I only create a two minute video, um, maybe it can create a lot of viewership, but maybe it might not hit the interest or, or it might not hit the sweet spot of the real actual buyer that, that has 20 million to buy. Maybe the $20 million buyer he don't want to spend so much time to come down and view the place first. He, he wants to spend that 20 minutes to really appreciate this property, understand about the properties, look at the whole thing. And then he wants to make a decisive decision to whether should he spend his precious time coming down to look at the physical product or maybe he can just buy it like this. So uh, that's basically our ideation. And we also realized that um, the moment we have that uh, in mind, then within the home tour, it allows us, us to be creative with motion graphics. Uh, we can then be a little bit more courageous to talk about some of the, uh, the obstacles. So for example, um, a lot of our home tours, we talk about the, the bad stuff of the property. Like if there's a direct, I mean, in Singapore, it's a little bit different from the States because in Singapore, everybody don't like direct afternoon sun. So, so the, the facing of properties is very different, right? Um, everybody is looking out for that north-south facing. They don't like a, a western exposure property because it's really humid and hot in Singapore. So um, sometimes your property has a western exposure, the valuation is, is affected. So, But we talk about that candidly in the video and we offer solutions on how to solve it, right? So... Um, uh, with a longer home tour, it allows us to to be a little bit more creative with things like that. Yeah, that's that's super interesting that you, you you're you know telling us a little bit of more insights on what you guys are doing because it's you know I've seen a lot of the home tours right of of you of you guys and of people in the states as well. But oh. um, you know you've seen the you've seen the monotone videos right of people doing it <laughs> with just the the scripts and then we see how you guys are doing these videos and there there's really a lot even you know people who are doing home tours in the United States can, can learn from, you know, just the creative process 
and how you guys are, are presenting the, the homes, like, like an actual showing, which is, you know, it's simple enough in concept, but doesn't seem like people are, are just thinking that way. So that's, that's super interesting that you guys are thinking as creatively as you guys are. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, Melvin, this is, uh, this is awesome. So, I mean, what you guys are doing, you clearly have a, a big team. And um, for all I can tell, you guys are, are looking to grow your team as well. So, I mean, you guys have clearly had a lot of success as an individual. And I kind of wanted to dig a little bit more into, you know, your thoughts and your experiences kind of moving from that individual success now transitioning into CEO, team leader, and being, a, you know, an overall leadership position as well. Yeah. Yeah. So um, being an individual realtor is, is vastly different from becoming a team leader or managing a team. Um, I think uh, the uh, the transition happens uh, because uh, in in the early part of uh, the video marketing season, which is in 2016, 2017, when we first started out, um, because for, for a good 10 years, we have always been trying to figure out uh, the lead gen and to crack the code on lead gen. So... Basically, the first 10 years when we started as an individual realtor, uh, we have been creating lead gen funnels uh, as an individual realtor, right? So I think the shift happens uh, because um, we went into a very aggressive mode to do very intentional lead gen um, in 2016 and 2017 and 2018. And that gave rise to um, a huge, uh, I would say a huge inflow of leads um, on a daily basis. Yeah, so with that, we know that it is becoming like a, a green light uh, for expansion. That means uh, that gives us sort of like a permission to, to, to scale the team. Uh, and then with the rise in lead gen, uh, it also makes us the choke point now because uh, now we have more customers, but we cannot fulfill the promises that we want to deliver. And the choke point happens because I still remember in 2018, there were so many weekends that we, are, we were unable to conduct viewings for certain listings. And there was one point that we were handling like 40 over listings at one shot. And every listing demands viewings on the, the Saturday and Sundays. So we know that it's going to be a choke point. We will become the roadblock and eventually customers will not be happy and the homes will not be sold. And then we'll start to go downhill again. So um, we know that we will then have to create something different. Uh, which is why we started the inside sales team concept and uh the inside sales team concept basically is is a lot like all the team models in the states yeah it's about um doing things together as a team compensation is uh, uh uniquely structured it's not like the one-man show system so basically most of our guys are on a 50 50 split and um um, of course, we, we generate leads uh, on, a, on the brand level uh, and the leads flow into our guys and we allocate leads and stuff like that. We also encourage our guys to do their own prospecting and, and sphere of influence. So um, with that, um, we have grown the team from 2019 until today. So now our sales team is about 53 people. And um, basically the, the, the key is that uh, I think from that season onwards is about me really picking up a lot of uh, leadership skills. And um, now it's, 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 more, it's not just about serving our clients, it's, it's really about serving our, our teammates as well internally because they are, they are also internal customers in a sense. So when, when you run a team, um, basically now you have two sets of customers. You have to make sure that your own people are functioning healthily. Um, they are motivated, they're happy, uh, they find purpose and satisfaction in their work, uh, serving the external customers together. So, so I think a lot of different kind of skill sets that we have to develop along the way. And one thing that I realized uh, is extremely important is that we have to continue to to cast a um, a mid to long range goal and vision because if we don't do that, then people sometimes they will think that you know they they are not sure why are they here. They, they can lose track of their, their purpose and vision. And uh, we always have to, um, I think, find positive ways to, to encourage everybody uh, not to care too much about the noise outside because uh, firstly, this industry is already anxious enough. It's so competitive. Uh, and uh, nowadays, um, 
there's a lot of noise and distractions and, and pressures from the outside world. And especially when somebody comes in the real estate industry, the noise can come from their own family as well. Yeah, because everybody is expecting you to succeed very quickly. They are, they are always asking things like, when are you closing your first deal? You know, uh, how, much, how much will you earn in this first year? Why don't you just go back to a fixed salary job? Why do you want to do this? You know, so, so our younger people also have a lot of pressure coming from that. And um, so I, I think it's about having empathy uh, in terms of leadership, um, always being um, a little bit like, um, it can also be a little bit like parenthood, like you're trying to parent your, your child, but over here you are, you're trying to, to make sure that your, your teammates are, are, are healthy in terms of their mindset, in terms of their skill sets as well. Yeah, so, so, so basically that's, that's just some stuff that we, we gather over the years. But um, that is, is of course a team portion on the system portion, there's also a lot of things that we, we need to concurrently build at the same time because uh, every business has different business pillars, right? So um, when you scale the team, you need systems to support the team. Um, you also need to have more um, content uh, to, to bring in more leads as well. So coming back to one of your questions, I think a lot of people will ask, hey, uh, when we create the home tour, um, what is the mindset behind creating the home tour? Is it to help the home seller or is it to generate more leads, right? So I think um, generating more leads from a home tour is a, is a ripple effect. Yeah, the, the first intent is definitely to help the home seller position the home differently. And I think the core intention of filming a home tour, it must always be the mindset that, hey, I really want to help my client sell their home is for selling their home, right? And I, it shouldn't be of the mindset that, hey, uh, I'm making use of this property to position my brand to gain more sellers. Because I think if that mindset is skewed, then uh, people will know, people will realize through time that you're just making use of their properties, right? And um, if your intent is correct, that means you really help them position their home differently and that home sells, then it creates a ripple effect for more business because other owners will then know that, hey, your method of marketing really works. Yeah, so I, I think we have to get number one correct before number two comes. Yeah, so number two is ripple effect of more clients, but number one should be that first. That means to really sell the home. Yeah, so, so, so basically that's, that's coming back to the content part. And so team morale, systems, uh, content, and uh, constantly exploring more lead gen funnels. And at the base of the pillar, it should be really building a solid culture within the team because um, like recently, um, 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 I heard this uh, so-called quote saying that, you know, um, culture is strategy for breakfast, right? So basically, uh, if your culture is not set um, correctly and it's not inculcated consistently, uh, the bigger team that you have, the more problems that you have. Yeah, because people will start comparing within the team. There will start to be culture issue or backstabbing and stuff like that. So we want to uh, remove that or reduce as much as possible so that everybody can focus their mental energy on the customers rather than looking inward. It should be really thinking about how can they, they be better and better for their customers. Right. Well, that's, yeah. that's awesome that you guys, you're sharing that because um, that is one of the biggest issues that I think a lot of, a lot of teams run into is that there's a lot of internal competition uh, between people, especially when, you know, maybe when leads are shared, that could be uh, an issue some people can run into. So, I mean, is that, is that an issue that you guys are seeing or like, what do you think right now is, you know, the biggest issue? I mean, obviously running a 53 person team is not, you know, something anybody can just do. So, I mean, what is something that you guys are seeing are, are some issues that are, are maybe popping up a little bit that you guys are, are really working on to right now? Yeah, I think um, what we have learned over the years and uh, of course, uh, even now, uh, we want to continually inculcate that um, our mental energy should really be focused on the customers. Mm -hmm. uh, but inevitably, everybody, um, we're all human beings, right? So naturally, in the team, there's a combination of seniors and juniors. Yeah, so some things um, that uh, we consistently want to inculcate is that um, um, we have a set of core values and of course that, that's on our website. Um, but 
I think the way to lift out the core values is really through action. So uh, one thing that um, I personally observed in my very initial year as a brand new realtor is that 15 years ago, when I came in in my first year as a full-time realtor, the experience was so traumatic in the sense that no seniors will want to talk to you. And um, all seniors will view the junior as somebody that comes in to eat my pie, right? And yeah, you're coming here to compete with me. And thus, I'm not going to share any uh, uh, of my best practices with you. I'm not going to share how I do deals and stuff like that. And you're on your own. So um, when, we, uh, when, when I recall that and when we are setting our team and our office and things like that, the very first thing that we did was that uh, we tear down all the director's room when we got our, our first office. So we told all the seniors, we said that nobody's going to have a fixed sitting. We're all doing co-working space uh, module. Everybody can work anywhere. The reason is because we want all the seniors to be fluid. We want the juniors to feel that there is no hierarchy here and that we are all really teammates that are, that are serving the customers together. So, so that's one way of removing the barrier of seniority and um, we follow this um, young and older ox yoking theory so basically you know in the in the farm um, when the farmer wants to plow the, the soil right they will usually yoke the younger ox and the older ox together and the reason for doing that is that because the, the younger ox has a lot of energy but no experience but the older ox has a lot of experience. So um, when we yoke them together, basically they can plow the soil more effectively. Uh, and that's what we do here at Property Limbras as well. Most of our, our listings are handled through a buddy system. So we created this thing called a buddy system. Uh, every customer is being served by a buddy um, 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 so-called uh, tagging system. So um, that means each listing, each home seller, they have two realtors serving them together. Yeah, and usually it's made out of a younger uh, and a, a more senior realtor. So they, they work on the deal together as a buddy system and they, they share their, their split uh, equally. So that allows um, a lot of knowledge transfer. It allows a lot more empathy. It allows a lot more mentorship as well. So uh, that's, that's one thing that we're doing on the ground to make sure that we bridge this gap and we, we bridge the knowledge transfer gap. Um, the other thing that we did was that we, we ourselves, we tore down all the director's room. That means uh, if you come to our office, we are usually working off the dining table. Uh, we are usually in the middle of my video editors. Um, so we also want to remind ourselves not to have that segregation in terms of hierarchy. So, so that we are more approachable, we can, we can listen to them, we can hear things on the ground, we can implement things very quickly. And um, within the team, of course, um, in terms of the amount of trainings that we have, I think that we have um, uh, very consistent huddles every week and trainings every week. So uh, that has been an ongoing thing to make sure that everybody is in the mode of learning and executing at the same time. So um, we also have, uh, in terms of like, maybe one key practice is because of the fact that um, Saturdays and Sundays and, and evenings are usually... Um, the key viewing kind of schedules for a realtor. So um, we have like a, a dedicated day on Wednesday as like the Sabbath day. And uh, that's the day that our realtors will, will rest and they will not come to the office. And that's the time that they will spend with their family. So basically, um, that's how we try to inculcate some of these values uh, so that everybody can, can last longer in the long game and, and not burn out in the short run. Yeah, that's awesome. And I... I hear you tell the story of you guys tearing down the director's room and it reminds me of a, a story of, I think it was a, a senator or some some public official in the U.S. who literally tore his door down. They literally tore his <laughs> door down so that, you know, it's an open door policy. So that's that's awesome that you guys are, are doing that and moving, you know, just not just moving your team forward, but really kind of setting a really good example for, for the industry, um, you know, especially in Singapore as well. So that's really good that you guys are doing that. And um, yeah, and uh, just to kind of, you know, wrap things up and, and looking forward, man, you guys are always on the, uh, you know, on the innovative, on the attack, in my opinion. So what's next for, for you guys? What's next for uh, you? And what's next for, uh, you know, Property Limb Brothers uh, as, a, as a company as well? Yeah, so um, one thing that um, 
uh, we are moving towards too is that um, we are creating our brand to be uh, pivoting towards uh, like a content hub. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, content hub in the sense that we want to be like, you know, the, the real estate Netflix in Singapore. So yeah. um, uh, the, the, the quick vision is that um, anybody that comes to our platform basically um, uh, is a hub whereby they can enjoy all kinds of real estate content in Singapore. Uh, and we're also investing a lot into uh, analytics tools. So we want to, we are, we're in the midst of developing by phases, a range of tools that home buyers can use um, to analyze different types of condominiums, different types of properties in Singapore. Uh, so we are creating uh, tools that taps on uh, the government's API, uh, different kind of data points. And then uh, using our experience on the ground, we create tools that are not available in the industry, but available on the platform so that consumers can just come use them and we can educate the public more as well on, on selecting the right property. So combination of a content hub, um, data analytics tool. And of course, the, the third point is that um, we are also starting our, uh, we have just started like a research arm to come with our own research, um, researching uh, on internal and external uh, kind of um, factors on, on understanding more on from the consumer's point of view, what are they looking for, um, as well as generating in-house research to educate the public as well. So um, the research arm also serves as um, the brainchild for us to create more content. Yeah, so, so basically, uh, these are the three pillars that we're moving towards too. Uh, I would say that in short, is like creating a real estate hub in Singapore. And uh, right now, these are, these are some of the gaps that we see in the industry, which is why we are moving towards this direction. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome, Melvin. It seems like you guys have a lot, uh, you know, a lot of innovating to do, and uh, you know, it never really stops when you're you're a creative thinker like yourself, right? So, um, you know, just to, uh, you know, for our audience, you know, if they wanted to reach you, if they wanted to see, you know, some of your videos, what are some ways that they can find your content uh, online? Yeah, so they can, can just go to YouTube and Kim Property Lim Brothers, um, or they can uh, just head on to Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, or TikTok. Uh, or just head on to our website, propertylimbrothers.com. Um, and uh, you can just Google us. Um, you'll be able to find us on, 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 on Google itself. Yeah. And here, here's a tip, guys. If you just Google Singapore real estate agent, you'll probably find uh, Property Lim Brothers uh, somewhere on there pretty quickly. <laughs> so they're, they're all over the internet, not hard to find at all. And I'll definitely include all the information in the show notes uh, below as well. So it's easy for you guys to, to find. But Melvin, thank you so much for being on the show today. You definitely shared a lot of insights that um, I think would be really useful for our audience today. So thank you again for being on the show today. Yeah, happy to be here. Thanks. Thanks for inviting. Yeah. Yeah. No problem. And you guys, uh, you know, who are listening, if you guys thought this was helpful, make sure you give it a share, a like, or a review. And uh, thank you guys again for tuning in, tuning in. And I will see you guys on the uh, on the next show. Take care, guys. All right. Cheers. Yeah. Yeah.